Okay, but I'm not going to repeat everything I said earlier. Um, I want to go back over this uh, because there are so many things that we can learn by repetition. It helps us to understand God's word even more clearly when we have a good grasp on just what it is that we're trying to, to understand. So we're going to call this the promise of rest. God promised there would be a time that we would enter into his rest. Now we need to understand something right off from the beginning. Number one, <clears throat> uh, we need to understand um, that God, when he created the, the world, the heavens, the earth, and everything in it, he didn't, he didn't, he was like any craftsman. And I think that's where we get it from. That he stood back and watched what he had created. And he was pleased with it. And so he blessed it. And so then he, we see in words that he was, he, he uh, it would seem that he was fatigued and they needed to have that rest. But God does not need a rest. He's never weary. He's never overworked. He's never tired. You might want to find that in Isaiah, verse 28 through 29. But I want to go to over here now to Matthew because we're setting up what we're going to be talking about. Matthew, verse 11, verse 28. Chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus gives true rest. A day does not give rest. Over the years, as a minister in the Worldwide Church of God, that I have seen people come to church with all their burdens, with all their anxiety, with all their difficulties in life, and leave the church with the same problems they went in with. So, what does that tell us? It tells us that just going to church is not the answer. There's more to it. It goes much deeper. After church sometimes, I would sit down with uh, people and counsel with them. And they would come to me and say, Pastor John, I feel like I got the weight of the world on my shoulders. And then I would talk to them about Matthew eleven twenty eight. I said, you know, Jesus Christ has made a statement in the Bible, that if you come to him with your burdens, you come to him with, you, with all your fears and all your anxieties, that he's going to give you a way to deal with them. In Matthew 12, verse 8, For the Son of Man, Lord even of the Sabbath, this is Jesus talking. The Pharisees are challenging him. And what are they challenging him about? They're claiming he is breaking the Sabbath. His disciples are breaking the Sabbath. Because as they go through the field, they pick corn, wheat, whatever it might have been. And he reminds them of David, how he went into the temple and he got food for those that were with him. And Hebrews 4, 7 through 8. By merely entering the promised land. We're talking about the Israelites. Now neither we all realize that 
Israel had wandered in the desert for 40 years. They had been in captivity for 400 years. Now unless someone in the, in the tribe had kept a record of the families, then they probably didn't know who they were related to. They had probably lost all understanding of who God was. They didn't have scribes. They didn't have Bibles. They didn't know who God was. But their father Abraham, who was loyal to God, and these people all came through the father Abraham. And they probably didn't know who Abraham was anymore. You see, I have had three sisters in my family. Two of them I wouldn't recognize if they walked through that door right now. Because I haven't seen them since I was 18 years old. And I can't call them family. And why is that? Biologically, we're related. But they don't know me, and I don't know them. I would know Jesus Christ coming through that door quicker than I would my own family. So much is for So that has been done in a short 50-year period. Imagine being 400, 400 years in captivity, how much you would forget. And so, <clears throat> when they entered into the promised land, it did not mean that they entered into the rest that God was talking about. See, God didn't have to change his plan as uh, time went on. He knew they weren't going to keep it. He knew they were not going to come to understand what he was talking about when he talked about the true rest. In Luke 5, 37 through 39, I want to talk to you this really interesting here at this point, and then we'll move, continue on. I ask you this question. If you take a car, a car may uh, say a classic, a 1967 Charger, okay? I happen to have one. And you paint it, get rid of all the rust, fill in whatever you have to. Might even put in a new engine by now. And you make it look real sharp. And you take it out to the different places car shows, so on and so forth. People say, man, that is a sharp car. It looks brand new. Is it new? Is it really new? No, it's not. All right. Let's go to Luke 5, 37 through 39. 5, 37 through 39. Now God, Jesus Christ is talking to people and he said, No man put new wine into old wineskins else the new wine will what? Burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins shall perish. What is he saying there? Verse 38. But new wine must be put into the wineskins, and both are preserved. And then he goes on to verse 39. No man having drunk old wine immediately will desire the new, 
For he will say, the old wine is better. You know what that's talking about? It's talking about the new covenant. It's talking about you can't take old pieces of the old covenant and mix it with pieces of the new covenant and then call it a new covenant. Can't be done. It's either old or it's new. And when we come to understand that you, um, I think that's a, 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 an excellent example of where we are today. We are in the same condition today as the ancient Israel. We make a choice on what we're going to follow and what we're not going to follow. Over here, chapter 4. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands. The promise is still there today. That we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And that in him we will find our rest. We will find our true rest. Make sense to you? Now, we might ask the question, why it is all on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. I have talked to many people. I've listened to many different programs. And some people do not understand what this scripture is talking about. First off, number one, Sabbath does not refer to worship. Yet some do. They call it, you know, whatever. There are some churches that are broken off from us. And they look at the Sabbath as a day of worship. That was not what it was intended to be. Today, some say, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, therefore I don't have anything I have to do. How would you know if a person is truly converted if they never, you never saw any change in them? How would you know? How would you know if a person was going through trials in their life, how they're doing, if they never share anything with you about what's going on in their life? Why wouldn't the person come to you and ask you and say, would you pray for me? I'm having some difficult times. Would you pray for me? Do you know why, do we understand really why it's all on the shoulders of Jesus Christ? I haven't overcome a thing in my life. So therefore, I cannot brag about what I've overcome, can I? And that's where God wants us to come to. That we understand that he needs, we need him. He doesn't need us. And when we come to understand that, yes, there's something I need to do. Because, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. What is the goal? The goal is for us to enter into that rest. And if we fail to do that and understand that, we're going to fall way short of the goal, aren't we?
Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Well, if you do nothing, then you fall short of it. So we continue on. In verse 2, For we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with what? With faith. Do we believe the word that's being preached today? Or just like it says back in Luke, some would prefer to stay with the old ideas. Ancient Israel didn't hear it. Today's message is not being heard. Look what we see happening in this nation. Now, we who have believed into that rest, just as God said. When we come to understand that we have been included, just what does that mean? We have a relationship with him. That those who do not believe don't have. You know, there's nothing that you and I can do to embarrass God. But I think one of the things today why people continue to live the way they live, continue to reject God, is that somehow they think that God doesn't love me. God doesn't care about me. And the reason why they feel that way is because they're being fed a message daily, just like you and I are. We have the choice to listen to Satan's radio waves or listen to God, which is going to be more powerful. And we do nothing. We do nothing. We're feeding right into Satan's hands. He doesn't want us to even look at the Bible. He doesn't want us even to think about it. So we move on down. And we, we see, and yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. Now on the seventh day God rested from all his work. And then again in the, in the passage above he says, they shall never enter my rest. Talking about from generation to generation to generation. Ancient Israel had an opportunity. Again, as I said earlier, when they entered into, uh, some people think that when he um, went into uh, the promised land, that there was a promise that was, from that point on, everyone would automatically be in God's rest. But it has to be mixed with something. And the main thing that Israel did or did not do was not believe in faith. You 
You know, <clears throat> some people misquote the scripture about taking God's name in vain. It's not about swearing. It's not about referring to or Jesus Christ when they're angry and they're cursing at their children or whomever. If you don't have faith and you don't trust Jesus Christ, that is what he is talking about. You're taking his name in vain, pretending to be one of his children. Think about that. That was just like years ago. No, years ago. Now, I think probably most of you remember Hulk Hogan, the wrestler. And he said, he pointed out something very interesting. When he was in school, nobody knew him. Cheerleaders never paid no attention to him. He wasn't one of the more popular kids in school. But then, when he became a wrestler, the man's got a brilliant mind, by the way, and the business that he created, selling t-shirts and different items. Went back to an old uh, reunion one time. And it's amazing what people do. Oh, I remember, I was real close friends with him when we were in high school and all that. And he used to laugh about that. He said, they didn't, they didn't even know anything about me. But they, that's taking his name in vain. He, they didn't really know him. And that's what Jesus Christ is talking about in Scripture. There are people, oh Lord, Lord, look what I've done, look what I've done, look what I've done. Is it, I don't even know who you were. Do you know why it's all been on Jesus' shoulders? So that we can claim anything. We can't. Look how good, look how much I have accomplished. Which raises the question, and I've often thought about this, what would I have been like had I come to know Jesus Christ in a much younger life? What would I be doing today? What kind of a life would I have had had I come into his being, into a relationship with him at a much younger age? I tell you what, I think the answer is this. He finally got me to where he wanted me to be. I just took a long road. It took a long time for me to come to realize I'm nothing. And I'm falling way short of what God wants me to be. So, it, in verse 6, it still remains that some will enter that rest and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. How much better would our lives be if we finally came to admit, God, I need you. I want to tell you guys something right now. I am sure glad that I'm in the position I'm in today. I would sure hate to be going through what I'm going through right now without God on my side. You know, 
people like me who have had a change in their life going through and the, and the, what I'm going through is not the most terrible thing but it is a change when you're walking one day and the next you're not if I were to sit down with someone who was going through the same thing I'm going through right now you know what I tell them you got any guns in your house get rid of them get them out of the house Because Satan will try anything he can to discourage you and to say that you're unworthy. Now, here's the other thing that's so important. We had a song sung today. Jesus loves you just as you are. You can never stop God from loving you. And you can never get him to love you more. That's been taken out of our hands. So when you see people say, oh, I love Jesus. And then you see what kind of life they live. You begin to wonder. Verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Who was the Sabbath? Jesus Christ. Is it a day? No. Can we claim Jesus Christ as our personal Savior? Can we claim him as the only righteous and that in our unrighteousness, he still loved us. And can we make ourselves right with God? I want to go back to something here because I think it's so interesting. And this thought was put in my mind this morning as I was finishing up the sermon. Let's go back to Luke 5, 37 through 39. No man putteth new wine into old wineskins, else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, be spilled, and the wineskin shall perish. Verse 38. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. That is the reason why God gives us a new heart. We had to have a new heart. We had to be reborn. We could never, ever possibly think that we could enter into that rest. without first having a new heart and then having a relationship with our Heavenly Father. I don't know if you thought about that. But it is so important for us to understand that in order for us to truly be able to love one another, Oh, we can love one another from a physical point of view. I'm talking about the love that goes beyond the physical love. We cannot love one another 
the way God loves us with the old heart. He had to put in a new heart, a heart of flesh, and cast out the heart of stone. We should be praying for people who don't know this. We should be praying for people who are wrestling with this. But isn't this talking about the Sabbath day? Isn't it talking about going to church? Isn't it talking about the good things we do? No, it's not. It's talking about entering into into a rest with God Almighty, the triune family. This is something, as I was watching one of the Memorial Day programs, it really hit home. This woman who had lost her son who had lost her son over in Iraq or wherever it was, they talked about him. And the words he said, he was not just my son. He was all, every human being, he was their son. He gave his life to this country, not just for me, but for all people. Kind of rings the bell, don't it? Jesus Christ died for all people. Go to First Peter. says that God would like what? All. All to come to know who Jesus Christ is. I don't see the clock, but I think my time must be getting about round up. Did we take the clock down, did we, or what? What time do we have? Then after? Wow. See what happens when God gets you going? <laughs> Forget that. Anyhow, I do want to share this with you briefly. In him, we find our rest in all aspects of life. Jobs, daily way of living, how much more enjoyable life is when you finally turn to him and say, God, my life is yours. Do with it as you will. That is entering into peace with our loving Heavenly Father. And that helps us to understand just what the rest is. Jesus Christ. There is no other man. There is no other way to enter into that rest. Christ is the door. I need to correct something. Maybe some of you heard this. Back at Ambassador College years ago. You know what they used to tell the young people? Your folks went through the, came in through the back door. And you came in through the front door. Well, I'm here to tell you there's no such thing as the back door. There's only one door, and that door is to peace, joy, happiness, confidence, encouragement, comfort. Peace of mind comes only through who? Jesus Christ. Almighty God. We're now going to move from this part of the service to another part. 
And Father, just as I was saying in this sermon, that we are to love one another. We can't enter into that rest hating one another. We can't enter into that rest holding bitter attitudes for other, towards other people. The last commandment that Jesus Christ gave was that we are to love one another. And we cannot love one another unless we enter into that peace of mind, that rest God, that God has talked about. Thank you so very much. We can have a sigh of relief when we finally get to that point where we trust God, we trust you, we, have, we know that you're going to be there, and that Jesus Christ is the rock of our salvation. We pray this in his name, Father. Amen.